This morning, uh, our text is in Matthew chapter 7. It's actually just one verse, but I'd like to read for you the chapter. Again, because reading the Bible is perhaps the purest way to have the Word of God preached. Uh, this is God's Word. And without uh, human commentary, as it, as it were, it is the unmixed, pure, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And it contains many things, of course, that we need to hear. So we're not going to be looking at all these things. But at least they can be brought to mind. And we can remember what it is that the Lord wants us to do. Now this is the final chapter of the three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we are going to focus on verse 12, which basically our Lord tells us here, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. So let me read Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Again, I would remind you that Jesus was simply saying the same thing we've already seen. James telling us that judgment will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy because what the Lord is commanding us to do is to show mercy, to show mercy to all. Mercy isn't just forgiving somebody, but it's showing them love when they don't deserve it, showing them compassion when they don't deserve it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's what he wants us to do. 
That's what we're going to look at this morning. Now again, I would remind you that eternal life is more than just a duration of life. It goes on forever. It's more than a quality of life um, that we enjoy uh, a world of perfect love in heaven. It is knowing the Father and the Son. Remember, Jesus Christ came so that we uh, might know him. Remember, Jesus came to preach the gospel so we might know of him. He gave us his word so we might know about him. He gave us, really, the gospel so we might come to know him in a personal relationship. But he has also given us his spirit so that we might know his power in our souls, that we might know Jesus in a more intimate way. Now that power, as we've seen, first of all, is the power to love the Father, uh, to love God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us that example on earth. He loved his Father. And again, remember how it is he loved him. He loved him according to the definition he gave when he was asked what the greatest commandment was. He loved him with every single thought of his mind. Everything was taken captive to Christ, as it were. All that he did, all that he thought about was done out of ardent love for his father and the desire to honor him. And, and you know, if he was ever uh, tempted, as it were, not to think about the things of the Lord, he would cast that thought out of his mind immediately. Anything confronting with him and thought only those things that would honor him. He loved him with all the affection that he had to love within his, his heart. He loved him with, with everything within him and sought to honor him in all things. And of course, certainly, he loved the Father with all the strength that his Father gave him on a daily basis. Jesus didn't use his strength to go out looking for the next thrill, the next thing that might pleasure him, but he sought the Father's pleasure at all times with all his strength. In other words, Jesus loved him with his whole soul, with every power, with every faculty of his soul, which would include his imagination, his reason, his will, and of course, his affection and strength. Now this is what the Father commands, as we've seen. This is what it means to love him. This is the degree to which he wants us to love him. This is how he wants us to love him. And this is the way you must love him if you are to know Jesus Christ. But let's not forget there is also the second commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As we already saw in Matthew chapter 7, in everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you for this is the law and the prophets. Well you know Jesus showed us how to do this as well. And if you would know him this is what you must set your heart also to do. Now let me just say at the outset, we do need to recognize that this is actually going to be more difficult than what the Lord has called us to do, whether that, you know, with regard to the Father. Uh, whether that neighbor is a believer or not, it's much more difficult to love man than it is to love God. Because God is perfect. It's not hard to love someone who loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son to forgive you of your sins and to grant to you grace and a place in heaven forever. It's not hard to love somebody who is perfect in absolutely every way and who has, uh, well, who in and of himself is perfectly lovely and beautiful. You know, you know from your own experience once the Spirit of God has opened your eyes to see the beauty of Christ and to see the beauty of God, you know that there's nothing else you can do but love Him. But the same isn't true of mankind, is it? We're not quite as lovable as God. And yet, we are to love one another. We are to love our neighbors ourselves. This is what Jesus Christ did. This is the example that he gave us. So this morning, what I'd like to do is consider three things regarding Jesus' love for mankind. First of all, that Jesus did what, what I've mentioned before, what I consider to be perhaps the most difficult thing that God calls us to do. 
um, out of all of his commandments, he did the most difficult thing. He loved his enemies. I want to start there because I think that's where the love of Christ begins. Secondly, he did something else that was still difficult, though not quite as difficult. He also loved those who were his. We have to recognize we're not perfect, and yet Jesus still loved us. And then finally, the applicational point, which is, if you are to know Jesus, then this is what you must do as well. Love your enemies and love your brethren as you love yourself. Now, first of all, let's consider Jesus loved his enemies. And I think here we might actually be surprised by some of the things we see, though maybe not. We do need to understand exactly what he means here. Now, I want to start here because I believe the love of Christ begins here. As God, uh, the Son of God has certainly loved us from all eternity, but we do need to remember who it was he was loving, his enemies, because that's the way we came into the world. As man, he came into the world and loved us and came to save us, the Bible says, while we were still his enemies. John 3.16, by the way, I should have mentioned we are going to have some... Um, text displayed on the screen because I have a number of them in the sermon this morning. But I do want you to see this clearly from the scriptures. Now John 3.16 we read this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now this passage speaks about the father's love. But it certainly also includes the Son's love. It, it tells us that his love for mankind was so great that he was willing to covenant, as it were, with his Son through all eternity. You know, there really isn't a point in time in which this agreement was made. It was basically an eternal agreement between the Father and the Son that they would do something to provide salvation for mankind. The Father would send his son into the world. The son would come willingly and he would lay down his life to save all those who would believe in him. The father and the son would send the spirit of God into the world to give his people the ability to believe. And then the father would give the son those people that he actually came into the world to save, to be loved by them and to love them for all eternity. But again, I want you to notice for whom uh, the Lord says that he did this. He did it for the world. Now, in other cases in John chapter 10, for instance, we see that Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And we understand that, that those are the ones for whom Jesus laid down his life, those that the Father has chosen and given to them. And yet in this text, in John 3, 16, by the way, you can feel free to leave it up there while I'm discussing it. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world. And the world there is not the same thing as the elect. There is a sense in which God has mercy and compassion on the world. But I do want you to understand that only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are actually going to be saved. The world emphasizes the state that we were in when Jesus Christ came to save us. We were not his friends. We were his enemies. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. I want to remind you what Paul says was our state when Jesus came for us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were his enemies or while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus didn't come to lay down his life just for his friends, although he did tell his disciples that's what he was going to do. He was going to lay down his life for them. He, they were his friends. But 
he was also laying down his life for us. And we were his enemies when he came to do that. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul says exactly the same thing regarding himself because when Jesus died, Paul was not Jesus' friend. He says it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life, an example of, of his love for us, that he would love us while we were his enemies, and realizing that if he would save us while we were in that state, certainly he will keep us. But also to show us that he is able to save even to the uttermost, even those we might believe are unredeemable, the very worst. He is able to save them and very often is certainly willing to do that. Jesus didn't come for those merely who loved him, but he came also for those who hated him. He came to lay down his life, to die for his enemies. Now again, I, I just want to remind you it's certainly true that when Jesus Christ came there were already those who had received his grace there were already those who were inclined toward him who were already his friends who were waiting for him I mean such as Joseph and Mary such as Anna the prophetess who continually prayed and fasted before the Lord Simeon who was looking for the Messiah there were those who lived in the Old Testament who clearly were his before he came and were saved by his grace Adam and Eve, Seth, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth. Um, but remember that even they came into the world as enemies before the Lord's grace came into their lives. And you know what? There is a sense in which the Lord's love is not limited just to those whom he knew would believe in him. It even goes beyond that in Mark chapter 10 verses 17 through 23 uh, in this particular account of the rich young ruler we do have uh, something that Mark points out that may be somewhat surprising to us in our understanding of what it means to love and especially the love of Christ toward those who aren't even his which the rich young ruler shows himself not to be uh, again in Mark 10 verse 17 through 23 as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy, to enter the kingdom of God. By the way, do you notice that James said the same thing? Uh, be careful about seeking wealth. It's not going to save you. It could very well condemn you. Uh, has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in grace? Uh, accept what the Lord gives you and don't seek to be wealthy. But now getting back to this point, you know, getting past some of the issues this passage seems to raise about how we are saved, and let me just mention, we are saved by grace through faith alone, and not by our works. Our Lord Jesus was not pointing him to the commandments to say you need to keep these commandments in order to be saved. He didn't tell him to sell his possessions because he needed to do that good work. To be saved, Jesus pointed him to these things to show him he really didn't keep the commandments at all, and that he needed to repent. But what I want us to look at are basically two things. This rich young ruler was unconverted 
He did not receive Jesus Christ. He turned away from him, didn't he? And yet, when Jesus was confronted with him, Jesus felt a love for him. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Um, we're all familiar with the three words in Greek that can be used to distinguish different types of love. There's the word eros, which basically refers to lust, and it can refer, of course, to sexual desire. It can also refer to a desire for food. It, it's a fleshly desire of some kind. There's the word phileo, or phileo, from which we get the word uh, Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. It's that kind of love that we have for family members and things like that. But then there's that word agape, which is referring to a kind of selfless love, a care, a concern, a compassion, a mercy that goes beyond a brotherly love. It is the highest love that the Bible speaks of. That is the word that is actually used here when it says Jesus felt a love for him. Now, does that mean that Jesus was enamored with the, the rich young ruler? He thought he was great and beautiful and his heart just went out to him? No, what it meant was that Jesus cared for him. Jesus was concerned for him. Jesus wanted what was good for him. And it grieved him when the rich young ruler left him. You see, Jesus cares even for his enemies. Well, what did he do when he was on the cross? I mean, he prayed that his father would forgive those who had crucified him. And the way that it's written really throws that concern upon the soldiers who had done this act rather than the Jews who had actually handed him over. But with regard to the Jews, let's not forget that when Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. Luke 19, verses 41 and 42. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Jesus wept over what he knew they were going to do and what was going to come on them because of that. Did Jesus love his enemies? Did Jesus care about his enemies? Did he care what happened to them? Yes, he did. Uh, even in the Old Testament, even during times of apostasy, uh, let's not forget that, that when the prophets spoke, they spoke by the Spirit of Christ. And Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. Turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Jesus loved his enemies. I, I hope you can see that. I think sometimes, we, you know, sometimes our theology trumps what the Bible says. We need to be careful. Sometimes our logic, we work certain things out to some kind of logical conclusion, and we, we come to conclusions that don't square with Scripture. We need to let the Scripture speak for themselves. Now, we do need to understand what it's actually saying. Again, Jesus isn't enamored with his enemies. He doesn't see anything lovely in them that draws his heart out to them. It's just that his heart is full of love, and he loves them. In much the same way the Father loved us, and we were unlovable, and desired to save us purely because of the love that was in his heart. Now, again, we're going to see that God has given us that same kind of love, and we need to love in this way, but realize that this is what Jesus did. And if you are to know him, you need to love in this way. Now, let me go to the second point, and we can do this one real briefly because I don't think there's any question in any of our minds that Jesus loved his own. John 11, verse 5. John writes, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. We're not shocked by that. We understand that. Jesus loves those who are his. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John 15, verses 9 through 14. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus loved his own. When he told them that he wanted them to love one another, he pointed to himself as the example of how they were to do that. Laying down one's life is the greatest expression of this love, Jesus said, and that's exactly what he did. He laid down his life for them, as we just saw, and he laid down his life for us while we were still his enemies. So now, what is the point? Well, the point is, if you are to know Jesus, if you are to experience his life in you, if you are to experience what it means to be Jesus Christ, which is what it means to be a Christian, right? One who is like Christ. Then you need to love your neighbor. You need to love even your enemies as Jesus loved his. Now, when Jesus gave the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, the one who asked him replied, who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself, to prove to himself that he had kept those commandments. Well, Jesus put his finger on a very sensitive area like he did with the rich young ruler. He pointed to the rich young ruler's treasures. In this case, he pointed to the Samaritans. You don't love Samaritans. He gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan shows us who your neighbor is. Anyone who happens to be near you, particularly those who are in need, whether they be friend or foe, the Samaritan, remember, loved his enemy. He didn't make the Jew in this story love the Samaritan because that would have, you know, sort of puffed up the Jews, but he made the Samaritan love the Jews, which was a further rebuke to this Jewish man. The Samaritan loved the Jew, had compassion on him when he saw him. Even though he was an enemy, even though the Samaritans hated the Jews, he saw a man in need, and he felt compassion. But he did more than just feel it and say, you know what, friend? Be warm and be filled, and went on his way. But he actually stooped down and took care of the man's needs, bandaged up his wounds, poured oil and wine on it, and took him to an inn and gave the money that was necessary so that his needs would be met. Jesus said to the scribe who asked him the question, you go and do the same. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Love our neighbor as ourself, even our enemies. Don't forget what Stephen did. Same thing as Jesus when he was being stoned to death. While the rocks were still hitting his body and crushing his bones and creating unimaginable pain, he looked up and saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father and he says, Lord, do not lay this sin uh, to their charge. Do not hold this sin against them. And he died. Jesus says that is what you are to do. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, again, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you are to know Jesus Christ, you need to love your enemies. Now, particularly, you need to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. I believe they're singled out in Scripture that as far as loving them, we need to love them more than we love those outside the church. As Paul said on one occasion, while you have opportunity, do good to all men, but particularly to those who are the household of the faith. We've already seen that Jesus told us we need to love one another as he loved us. 
He said earlier on that same occasion in John 13, verses 34 through 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Paul says in Romans 12.10, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And he says in Romans 13, verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor <clears throat> has fulfilled the law. 1 Peter 1, verse 22, Peter writes this, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And then John writes in 1 John 3, 23, This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. If you are to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you must not only love your enemies, which is, again, much more difficult, but you must particularly love his people as Jesus loves them. Remember, this is what Jesus' life was all about. This was his coming into the world to fulfill the law, basically that he would love the Father in the way that we've seen, and that he would love his neighbor. Now, we haven't gone into detail as to how to do that, and that's something we may, or, well, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to look at in future sermons. But that is what Jesus is. That is what he's all about. This is the example that he has given to us. And so this is what we need to seek to be. This is what we need to seek to do. Now let me just close again in reminding you where you are to find the strength, the power to be able to do this. <clears throat> You're not going to find it in your own flesh. You can only find it through Jesus Christ. You see, if you don't know Jesus, you really can't love <clears throat> in this way. You need to turn from your sins. You need to trust in Jesus Christ. You need His Spirit. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. If you don't know Him, you must know Him. But if you've already trusted the Lord, there's something you can do. And again, what it is is this. Seek Him with all your heart. Devote your life to Him, your whole self, to love the Father with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of love. And without the fullness of the Spirit, there's no way that you're going to be able to grow into the image of Christ. As a matter of fact, to the degree that you have the Spirit of God, to that degree alone, you can be like Jesus. So if you're not much like Jesus, it's because you don't have much of the Spirit. And so in order to do that, you need to cut off your sin. You need to put it to death. You need to, to put off the things that extinguish that fire of the Spirit in your soul. He wants to be a raging fire. He wants you to love God in this way. He wants you to love your neighbor in this way. And he's willing to do that for you, but you need to seek him and you need to cut the things off that extinguish his work. And don't forget what those things are. It's basically the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. It's just like pouring ice water on the fire of the Spirit of God. You need to cut those things off and stoke your soul with those means, with the oil of his grace, that you might love more, that you might love the Father more, that you might love your neighbor more, that you might become more like Jesus. Now, again, this is one of the ways we stoke that. Prayer is one of the ways we stoke that. The Lord's Supper is one of the ways we stoke that. But we can stoke all day long. And we can shovel as much coal into our furnace as we can get, but if you keep pouring the water on it, you're not going to get anywhere. So you have to deny your flesh. 
and you need to seek the Lord and devote yourself to Him, if you do, you will grow in these areas. If you don't, you will not. So let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us grace to change and to do what it is He calls us to do that we may truly seek Him, that we might become more like Him and that we may cut off those things that m cause us to move backwards. So let's, let's pray.